welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into American political origins and evolving institutions. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this continuing conversation. Here he is now, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome to another week of programming at the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Uh, it is a Monday. It is the 13th day of October. Uh, it is officially uh, Columbus Day. Uh, the, obviously, Columbus Day is the 12th, which was yesterday, and it's being celebrated today. A lot of a lot of people are off today. Mail deliveries and banks and other other places are are enjoying the three-day weekend um, this weekend. As we look forward to another week here at the Virtual Center, I want to welcome those of you who have uh, tuned in on this, on this Monday, on this holiday, if you will. And I invite you to participate actively in our program today by feeling comfortable picking up the phone and giving us a call and sharing your ideas and your thoughts with our listeners. We have a phone number that is available just for that purpose. It is area code 304-574-8178. That's 304-574-8178. If you'd like, rather than doing that, if you'd like to communicate directly with me via email, I invite you to do that. My email address is waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien906 at gmail.com. Welcome to another in our programming here at the Virtual Center. We have entered into our 20th month of broadcasting um, as of uh, Saturday, the 11th of October, we had reached the, the plateau, a plateau of 19 months that we've been doing these programs. It's hard to believe that, that we've been here that long, but we have, and we've got uh, a number of archive programs to prove it. So uh, I thank you for tuning in. I thank you for your faith and your continued support for the Virtual Center and also for the Head On Radio Network and for Bob Kincaid and the folks at Head On. Uh, we obviously, I was going to say we depend on, we are exclusively dependent upon your support and your willingness to trust us and give us your ear and hope that we will provide the kind of programming that may, what makes your continued support worthwhile. If that support can be no more than listening and tuning in and participating occasionally by picking up the phone and giving us a call, uh, that's wonderful. If you can support the Head On Radio Network and the programming on it um, in some sort of way financially, that also is extremely appreciated because very honestly, that's more than anything else what keeps the network, and programs like the Virtual Center on the air. So thank you for your continued support, more importantly for your trust. And, and obviously, uh, continued support reveals an element of trust and faith. I personally take that very, very seriously. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate your willingness to, to tune in. Again, our phone number Area code 304-574-8178. Before we get into uh, today's program, I, I wanted to, first of all, I wanted to alert you uh, to the fact that we will be, on Wednesday, we'll be uh, doing a, a, a previous, reviewing or playing a previous program uh, here at the Virtual Center. I have a, an engagement Wednesday um, that's going to take me out of town for the balance of the of the day, and um, I had uh, forgotten about it until this weekend. Actually, it was a it was a luncheon engagement that I had agreed to several weeks ago, and um, 
it it is occurring this Wednesday uh, at noon, and uh, it's a it's in an adjoining county, and it's well over one hour from home. I have to drive more than an hour to get there, and it's a luncheon engagement. So I would no way could I be back for a one to three program on on Wednesday. But we will be here tomorrow at our regular time on Tuesdays, which is one half hour later. We'll be beginning in the east at 1.30 p.m. tomorrow. And, of course, we're here today for our full two hours, uh, 120 minutes together. And and I appreciate, again, your willingness to, to join us. I thank you for that faith and trust. And I just want you to know that I'll do everything I can to honor that. Uh, before we uh, get into uh, the substance of, of the program today, um, first of all, let me say in terms of today's program that we're going to uh, go in a, a little bit different direction for a couple of days. Uh, we've been focusing, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, given the, the mission of the Virtual Center, we've been focusing as much as anything else on the Federalist Papers and more specifically on those who wrote them, namely Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and to a lesser extent John Jay. And it's understandable because the focus, the focus of the Virtual Center is on the Constitution. What I'd like to do today is get into an issue raised by another one of the Founding Fathers, namely Thomas Jefferson. And recognizing that Thomas Jefferson was not at the Constitutional Convention. He was Congress's ambassador to France, if you remember, during the debates, during the Constitutional Convention uh, and the ratification struggle that followed it. And Jefferson does not come back to the United States until President Washington is inaugurated and asks Jefferson to serve as his first Secretary of State. And... Uh, that brings Jefferson back to the to the United States. Um, but while he's in France during this period of the late 1780s, that doesn't mean that he's not aware of and on, on, and on top of and ha does not have his finger on the things that are going on in this country. Um, as we've mentioned many times here at the Virtual Center, Jefferson engaged in an absolutely delightful, delicious, rich uh, series of letters back and forth um, with James Madison. And um, much of the interpretation of the Constitution and the Federalist Papers or the explanation for it uh, can be found uh, in the exchanges between these two people because while there are numerous letters, I, th I think at one point in time, I think um, Douglas Adair, the historian Douglas Adair, uh, made reference in one of his many articles um, that uh, there were, uh, I, I believe I'm thinking of something like 17 or 27 or something, I, the number escapes me right now, uh, letter exchanges during this entire period from the from the meeting of the Constitutional Convention through ratification itself. During that entire period, there's a tremendously rich back and forth, give and take, if you will, between Jefferson and James Madison. And Madison is, is explaining different aspects of the Constitution to Jefferson, but more important is giving his rationale on why that particular element or item is in the Constitution at all and what the, what the intent uh, of the Convention and his personal intent uh, might be to, to put it there. And Jefferson, of course, is not averse to responding substantively to these communiques. And the result is that the letters between them are not only frequent, but they are long and they are quite substantive. They are very, very worthwhile to read. Um, and again, if you go to, uh, to the uh, Madison Papers or the Jefferson Papers, uh, and you can get these on the Rotunda website, University of Virginia, um, we have access here in West Virginia to the Rotunda website through Concord University. But in order to gain access to that particular database, uh, 
one must have an email address through Concord University. So for graduate, for current students as well as alumni, graduates of Concord University, there is access to Rotunda through Concord University's website. But for everybody else, you can gain access to the Rotunda collection through the University of Virginia Press. And if you go to the University of Virginia Press, you will, uh, you will find reference to the Rotunda website. The last time that I entered Rotunda that way, as I recall, I think everybody was allowed in for a limited period of time. I think uh, beyond that, um, you, you had to have some sort of uh, permission or pay some sort of fee or something like that. Although that could have changed because it's been more than a, more than a couple of years since I've done that. And the University of Virginia's whole point in the Rotunda uh, program in the first place was to make these resources available to the general public. So it is entirely possible that the access time to Rotunda through the University of Virginia Press has been extended even beyond what it was a couple of years ago. And uh, so I invite you to, to perhaps check on it that, that way. But what I wanted to address during in today's program was it was one particular item from the exchange between Jefferson and Madison. And this is one that, that I think most of us have probably heard of about Jefferson. I know I heard of it numerous times. And it's Jefferson's very famous argument that, that ultimately government and the nation belongs to the living to the current generation, not to the, not to the dead, not to the um, generation that has, that has passed. And several days ago, uh, I, I ran across reference to, reference to that particular issue, and I thought to myself, you know, I really have never done the spade work to actually go back and look at the source, at the, at the particular origins of that very famous position that is cited so frequently uh, in, wrench, in mentioning Jefferson. And so I found it, and it is a letter to James Madison written in 1789, right after Constitution has been ratified and the new government is beginning to take shape. It's after the first, uh, first federal elections under the Constitution, and it's at that point that Jefferson mentions the very famous phrase about the nation belonging to the to the living and it's a fairly extensive letter but as I found so many many times before the substance of these things is so much more valuable than we ever expect them to be and in reading this letter I couldn't avoid thinking to myself we need to get into this letter at the Virtual Center during one of our programs because it's a very, very important concept. It's a concept that many people know about and have heard about before, but Jefferson's rationale for it and his explanation for it, and more important, his recommendation to Madison that it needs to be included somehow in the new government as it gets underway is, I think, an issue that all of us need to address and need to be aware of. So that's really where I'd like to, to go today uh, in our program. Before I do that, um, I'd like to, and th this will not take long because we've already done this several weeks ago here at the Virtual Center, but I just wanted to make listeners aware that um, yesterday's Charleston Gazette in Charleston, West Virginia, um, was kind enough to publish uh, an article that I wrote some weeks ago and submitted to them on James Madison and on the 1829 letter that we spent quite a bit of time on here at the Virtual Center, uh, the letter in which Madison is supporting the expansion of the right to vote in Virginia to... Uh, 
household, uh, not only, well, in Virginia specifically, but obviously nationally as well, um, to householders and heads of families. And we spent quite a bit of time on that particular letter, as you'll recall. And in that letter, as a, you know, just as, as a reminder, Madison was speculating on the demographic changes that we could anticipate taking shape in the United States, in America, over the coming decades, and projects all the way up for 100 years beyond the time he writes this letter. He writes the letter in 1829. At that point in time, Madison's 79 years old. And he is speculating for a full century beyond then, which would take us to 1929, which, as we know, happens to be a very, very famous year in American history. It's in October of that year that the stock market crash uh, occurs and launches the United States and, and indeed the rest of the world into the so-called Great Depression. Madison is projecting population in the country over that period. But more important than that, he's he's speculating on a very, very specific kind of population growth. And already in 1829, Madison is quite aware that the nation of farmers, of yeoman farmers, that he has been so supportive of, um, all the way going, you know, going all the way back in his papers, and that Jefferson especially has been so supportive of, in his notes on the notes from the state of Virginia, uh, written in the early 1780s. The nation, principally composed of yeoman farmers, is changing and changing very rapidly as Madison, in 1829, can already begin to see the shift toward what is going to become in America industrialism. Specifically, he sees a rapid increase of citizens and immigrants coming into the country for jobs who are not going into farming. And he recognizes that there's not enough land in the continental United States to sustain a nation composed primarily of yeoman farmers indefinitely. And Madison sees the threat to the stability and security of the nation that that, 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 that poses because it predicts or it, it foresees a nation comprised of a larger and larger proportion of non-property owners, of laborers, of people literally living from check to check who do not and cannot afford property. And Madison, along with Jefferson, is very aware that when nations... When nations experience that kind of population growth, where a larger and larger percentage of your population is comprised of people without property, people without what the sociologists have called a stake in society, vested interest in the stability of your nation, then the situation becomes extremely dangerous and extremely volatile. And it's projecting that particular change that prompts Madison in 1829 to endorse, heartily endorse, the expansion of the right to vote to heads of household and heads of families. Because Madison believes and explains in that particular journal entry into his journal that the right to vote can serve the same psychological purpose as does property itself. It gives the voter a vested interest in the outcome of elections, in the politics of the nation, in the issues of the day. By definition, 
being able to participate in the governance of the nation cements people, glues people to it. Alexander Hamilton made the same argument in behalf of taxes. Hamilton believed that when people pay taxes, they are, in effect, buying a financial interest in the decision-making of the country at large because they help pay for it. And Hamilton believes that taxing people is a way to connect people psychologically and realistically to good government, to the government. Madison sees the same thing with the expansion of the right to vote. And Madison is endorsing this as a way to tie the increasing numbers of people without property to the future stability and security of the nation. We, we spent quite a bit of time on that, uh, on that article by Madison, as you'll recall. The article that I wrote was basically focusing on that article as, I think, fairly clear evidence that Madison is endorsing the idea of the living constitution. That in order for government to remain viable and to remain strong and to remain vigorous, government must be able to adapt to the kinds of political, social, economic, and demographic changes that are anticipated for the future. Madison believes that the viability of the Constitution of the United States itself is directly connected to its ability to adapt, to change, to meet new and potentially threatening situations, and do so in a proactive rather than a reactive way. In effect, then, Madison is giving a vote of confidence, if you will, in the idea of the living Constitution. The idea that the Constitution is not fixed in the truths and issues of the 18th century, but rather that the Constitution of the United States must be flexible, must be adaptable. In effect, the very famous necessary and proper clause in Article 10, uh, excuse me, Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, where Congress will have all the powers it deems necessary and proper to carry out its delegated powers. And it's under that that Hamilton is able to justify the creation of the United States Bank, even though that power is not specifically granted to Congress in the Constitution. Most people have linked the idea of the living Constitution to the Necessary and Proper Clause, more specifically to the interpretations of the Constitution rendered by the Supreme Court in, in, you know, in, in future times. The point of my article was that it seems to me that what Madison is doing here is refuting Justice Antonin Scalia and those who agree with him that the Constitution of the United States is fixed in time and that constitutionality of legislation is to be measured only by seeking the original intent of the framers. In other words, the only way that a particular piece of legislation can be deemed constitutional by the court is when it is consistent with written, delegated, specific powers within the Constitution of the United States. If it's not there, Scalia says, then you can't add it. In other words, Scalia's position is, and has been consistently, 
that the Constitution of the United States is not a flexible, adaptable document. It is not a living Constitution. Rather, it is fixed. And constitutionality is to be determined by original intent, by the text of the document itself. As we know, Justice Scalia has been adamant in pushing this idea of originalism over and over again during his tenure on the court. To say that he becomes something like a bully about it, I don't think is an overstatement at all. What those who advocate the idea of the living constitution have been charged to do by Scalia is find evidence that the framers themselves intended the document to be living and not fixed. I believe that this particular item, essay, by James Madison does exactly that. In effect, what Madison's 1829 position paper on expanding the suffrage in order to meet changing demographic circumstances in America in the, over the coming century is, in effect, direct evidence to refute the fixed Scalia position on constitutionality of the United States. I feel that that's the significance more than anything else of Madison's position paper written in 1829. Yesterday in the Charleston Gazette that piece was published and I, I just wanted to mention it. I wanted to encourage if you are interested in this and would like a copy uh, then by all means you can go to the Charleston Gazette and and find it. The Charleston Gazette website is wvgazette.com. wvgazette, West Virginia Gazette.com. And when you see it, you'll see a number of of choices along a bar and pick the section that says opinion. And if you click opinion you will see the most re recent opinion pieces, op-ed pieces, in the paper. And the very first one that you'll get now from yesterday's paper, October 12th, is the paper that I, that I submitted and that the, the Gazette was kind enough to publish. So I, I did want to, to mention that. I, I believe, and the reason I'm mentioning it again, I believe that this is really an important issue. I really believe for the future this is extremely important, because especially given the projections of what's liable to happen in three weeks when we have our off-year elections on the first Tuesday in November. Because as we know, the structure, the makeup of the court and the position that the court has been taking on issues seems to be at issue right now. There's no question that there are four members of the court, the, con the so-called conservative wing of the court, including not just Justice Scalia, but, Ju but Chief Justice Roberts, Justices Alito, and Justice Clarence Thomas. Those four seem to vote together more often than any other constituency on the court, if you are the type that goes back and look at, looks at those kinds of, of results. So what we have had on the court is a four to four split between liberals and conservatives with Roberts, Scalia, Alito, and Clarence Thomas forming the conservative group of justices, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stevens, Justice Stevens, and Sotomayor, and um, I'm 
I'm drawing blanks here on the on the members of the court right now. But Justice Kennedy has been the swing vote. It seems like if Justice Kennedy goes with the conservative majority, then more often than not, that group seems to win by five to four. And that's what's happened in some of the most important decisions the court has reached of late. I guess the, a major one being Citizens United. But the recent Hobby Lobby decision, it seems to me, falls into that same category. And with the coming elections this fall and the projections that the Republican Party is likely to take control of the Senate, that means that for all pur for, for, pur for purposes of discussion, that future Supreme Court appointments, which have to be approved by the Senate, the advice and consent of the Senate, tends to suggest the appointment of conservative justices rather than liberal ones. It seems to me that it is incumbent on those of us who believe that these people are rewriting history in the way they want to interpret the Constitution, we have got to begin to say it. And we have got to begin to say it over and over and over again. Because literally they are playing games with the Constitution of the United States and the interpretation of the intent of the founders. It, again, if you would like a copy of this article, you can go on your, on your browser, Explorer or whatever you might use, Chrome, Google Chrome or whatever, to wvgazette.com, click on Opinion, and then dated October 12th, you will see the article, and I think the title of the of the piece is "There's Life in the Living." There seems to be life in the living Constitution. I think what Madison has given us is the smoking gun that Scalia and his ilk have demanded. They have demanded the impossible, which is proof as to what the framers intended. I think in 1829. James Madison has given us that proof. And I think it's extremely important that we use it and use it often and use it wisely. So again, I, I you know, uh, if you would if you would like a copy, I invite you to uh, to go to that website. And obviously, after reading it, if you have uh, comments uh, on it, I would love to. I'd love to hear from you on, on those comments. Again, our phone number here at the Virtual Center, area code 304-574-8178. That's 304-574-8178. I mentioned at the outset of today's program, which is about a half an hour ago, that I wanted to focus today on Jefferson's very famous dictum about the nation belonging to the living and get into it in some substance, in some depth. And of course, when I, when I found the citation, the letter itself, in which Jefferson makes this argument, it's a letter to James Madison that Jefferson writes to Madison on September 6th, 1789. As we know, George Washington was inaugurated in March of 1789. And the government is underway from Paris. Jefferson writes Madison on this that he believes is such a significant issue. But before we get into the letter itself, it seems to me incumbent upon us, upon me, to justify the subject here at the Virtual Center. To what extent is the issue of surrendering control of the nation to the dead, if you will, to what extent 
is that an issue? Jefferson said, I set out on this ground, which I suppose to be self-evident, quote, that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living, that the dead have neither power, powers nor rights over it. We'll get into that later, but that's the quote. I set out on this ground, Jefferson says, which I suppose to be self-evident, that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living. U-S-U-F-R-U-C-T. Usufruct means the purposeful use of the earth the, for the benefit of mankind. If you surrender control of the earth to previous generations, you are in effect denying future generations access to the most useful uses, beneficial uses, of the nation, it's, of the earth itself. You are tying up future generations with obligations entered into by previous generations. You are literally tampering with the viability and the future success of the nation and its people. To what extent is this a problem in our world? What caused me to get into this topic in the first place is an, is an article that appeared in the New York Times more than a week, about a week ago, on October 7th. And the subject of the article is on the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement reached by the tobacco companies in America in November of 1998. And what has happened as a result of that agreement and the extent to which some states have not only violated the intent of the agreement, But more importantly, from the position of the virtual center, they have violated the entire principle argued so persuasively by Thomas Jefferson. And when I read this article, I immediately thought about Jefferson's article, uh, Jefferson's argument about the earth belonging to the living. And that connection is what I believe the bulk of today's program ought to be about. Because I think that in the future, having this program archived will prove valuable in and of itself because of the issue involved. The, the idea or the issue as to whether we are in effect tampering with the very viability of the future of this nation by some of the things we are doing to future generations. With that, let me go into the letter which appeared on October 7th in the New York Times, the title being How the Big Tobacco Deal Went Bad. The author is Jim Estes. And again, it appeared in the New York Times on, the, on October 7th, 2014, Dateline, San Bernardino, California. And this is, the, this is the article, and I think you will be astounded. I know I was, and I think before we get too far into this letter, you'll understand why. Jim Estes opens his article by asking the question, when was the last time that you saw 
an anti-smoking ad. You can remember that the televisions used to be filled with anti-smoking ads. Of course, today it's filled with political ads because of the upcoming election. And NPR yesterday, uh, this morning, reported that the sum total of the uh, campaign ads in this year's election, not just in one, any one state, but in all of them, is engaging in some of the most negative political campaigning in the nation's history. In other words, this campaign, more than any other, it seems, is fulfilling the worst fears of those who were really concerned about the Citizens United decision. As outside money is pouring into particular campaigns in order to affect and swing the voters in particular directions. When was the last time you saw an anti-smoking ad? In November 1998, the tobacco industry in 46 states reached what is known as the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement. Four states, the other four, reached their own separate agreements. This group deal, this master settlement, exempted the tobacco industry from legal liability for the harm caused by tobacco use. In return, the tobacco companies agreed to make annual payments in perpetuity. That means forever to the states to fund anti-smoking campaigns and public health programs. The industry guaranteed a minimum of $206 billion over the first 25 years of the agreement. I'm pretty astute. I mean, I, I watch politics fairly regularly, and I've I got to admit, I missed this. I missed the substance of this for some reason. Because I really did not appreciate the size and the power of this settlement. That the tobacco companies would pay these 46 states in perpetuity dollars which at a minimum over the next 25 years from 1998 would be at a minimum $206 billion. Estes makes the point that while the requirement that the states use the funds as intended, was not written into the agreement. It was anticipated that the states would use the money for the purposes for which it was intended, which is anti-smoking campaigns and public health programs. Of course, this is the whole point of the article. Some st many states didn't do that. Only a small fraction of the money has gone into tobacco prevention. Instead, the states have used this windfall for various expenditures unrelated to health. For example, in Alaska, three and a half million dollars in settlement money was spent on shipping docks. In Niagara County, New York, $700,000 went for a public golf course's sprinkler system and $24 million for a county jail and an office building. And, and I think this is the, one of the most ironic parts of, points here of all of them, in the state of North Carolina, which is the home of tobacco production, in the state of North Carolina itself, in what Estes calls the ultimate irony, $42 million of the settlement funds went 
to tobacco farmers for modernization and marketing tobacco. Not only didn't North Carolina use it for public health and in campaigns against tobacco, rather the state of North Carolina chose to use the settlement money to expand the marketing of tobacco throughout the world. Because obviously, as we know, as the tobacco market in this country decreased, the marketing of the product throughout the world increased. But that's only the beginning. Nine states, and here are the nine states, Alaska, California, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Rhode Island, and West Virginia. And of course, I am in West Virginia, so I found this particularly interesting. This is really what got my attention. Nine states, including West Virginia, as well as Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and Guam, decided to get as much of those annual payments as fast as they could. By mortgaging future payments as collateral and issuing bonds against them. I think we need to think about this for a minute as to exactly what this entails. What these states and municipalities did was to mortgage the future payments which would have come forever and use them as collateral in order to issue bonds against them. Estes conclusion, they traded their future lifetime income for cash in hand today. But here's the kicker, at only pennies on the dollar. In order to do this, In order to get their hands on this money early, they had to negotiate a deal where they were taking, where states were, it, were getting only pennies on the dollars promised. And then Estes go in, goes into explaining exactly how these bonds worked. And he says a typical bond is like an interest-only loan with a balloon payment in 30 years. Any of us who have bought homes or taken out loans will know what a balloon payment is. A balloon payment is when the interest is not paid regularly, but rather it all accumulates at the end, so that at the very end of the process, the payment is huge because it incorporates all the interest that was unpaid through the, life of the, through the life of the loan. But there's more. In order to avoid having to pay yearly interest payments, these 12 chose instead to issue capital, appreciate, capital appreciation bonds, deferring all interest payments and repayment for up to 50 years. Then the entire amount is due, with no plans made as to how it will be repaid. What these states did is mortgage the future in the interest of quick cash, money in hand, with no plans as to how this was going to be paid for when the bill came due in 50 years. By the time these bonds come due, SD says, the legislat legislators who approve them will either be retired or dead. This is where Jefferson 
came to mind for me right here. When you look at the specifics of this settlement or this deal, you'll begin to understand why I believe that this is a viable program for us here at the Virtual Center. Because of the high probability that these bonds will never be repaid, they had to be sold at well under their original value of $1,000 face value if they were going to attract investors. If investors were going to accept or buy into these bonds, then the only way that the states could make it work was to make the bonds available well under the face value of $1,000 on them. In other words, take less for the bonds. The 12 together, the 12 states, issued a total of $22.6 billion in bonds. Billion with a B. $22.6 billion in bonds. And for that $22.6 billion, the states received $573.2 million in cash. What these 12 states did was exchange $22.6 billion in future payments for $573 million that they could get their hands on right away. With compound interest, they will have to, these states will have to repay $67.1 billion. And then Estes gives us an example of what the reality of this deal turns out to be. Estes says, imagine borrowing $200,000 to buy a house today and your children having to pay back $234 million in 40 or 50 years. You buy a house for 200000 and you saddle your kids with a bill of $234 million in 40 or 50 years. That, Esty says, gives us an idea of the scale of this problem. Some of the states went even further, SD said. The state of Michigan will have to pay back more than 1,800 times the amount it borrowed. Can you believe that? 1,800 times. Future generations in Michigan will be saddled with this bill. The ownership of these bonds rests principally with banks and mutual funds. It's mutual funds and banks that bought the bonds. In research about the very specific nature of these bonds, Estes reports that the, these institutional investors, these banks and mutual funds, are betting that the states will step in at some point and bail out these bonds with some combination of all future settlement payments and taxpayer dollars. The investors who bought the bonds are banking on the fact that the states will not default. And at some point in time, <coughs> excuse me, as the due date gets closer and closer, they are betting on the fact that the state governments will step in and somehow pass legislation which dump this responsibility 
on future taxpayers 40 or 50 years down the road. The idea, this is, I'm quoting Estes here, the idea is that the states won't risk the stigma of a default and will protect their relationships with the, with the investors and bond brokers who also handle their municipal bonds. The way they're going to do this is by sticking future taxpayers with the bill. Here's the bill. Looking at the continuing decline in cigarette sales and the corresponding payments, many analysts, including me, SD said, believe that defaults will begin to materialize as early as 2026, 12 years from now. If all of the 12 try to stave this off and guarantee their bonds by pledging future tax or bond revenues to those bonds, the investors will receive a profit of 11,708%. Think about this. If the investors are correct in their predictions, and if the states decide that they are not going to default, but, and they really can't afford the default because these same investors, these same banks and mutual funds hold pension funds and various other forms of investments for these states. So consequently, they have to find a way to not default. And consequently, if they do step in and saddle future taxpayers with this bill, then the banks and mutual funds who bought the bonds in the first place will realize a profit of 11,708%. This is absolutely obscene. Estes goes on to point out that this is not just a what-if scenario. This isn't an imaginary situation. He points out that New Jersey and Rhode Island have already taken steps to reissue bonds with a guarantee of all their future tobacco settlement payments. The Oppenheimer funds, many of you have heard of Oppenheimer, it's a mutual fund operation on Wall Street. Oppenheimer Funds is suing the state of Rhode Island in order to prevent the reissuing of these bonds. In other words, to force the state to stick to the original deal, claiming that the state of Rhode Island intends to divert about $20 million from earlier bondholders, including Oppenheimer. In other words, by Oppenheimer realizes that if they let the state reissue new bonds to replace the old ones, then in the process, the current people who hold the original bonds will lose, and that's them. So they've taken the state of Rhode Island to court in order to prevent them from tampering with the original contract. In a sense, it poses the prospects of a contract clause decision by the courts at some point in time. And then Estes also point out, points out that as a result of New Jersey's guaranteeing of its bonds with its implications for the future, New Jersey's credit rating has been downgraded by Wall Street twice this year from stable to negative. I will point out to you, this is Governor Chris Christie's New Jersey with a negative bond rating on Wall Street as a result of this particular deal. And this is Estes reaching his conclusion. The only people making money on these bonds are investment bankers 
who were able to fool statisticians into believing that ready money, having cash in hand in the state coffers now, was more important than anything that might happen in the future. The fact that only these 12 issued bonds tells us that the vast majority of states recognize that this was a dumb idea. But 12 states did it anyway. And here's the dire prediction for what this is liable to mean for the future. SD says this will not be easy to fix. State legislatures are the only ones that can refuse to authorize a bailout or a guarantee of the bonds. And yet despite the, om the ominous examples of Rhode Island and New Jersey, there is still active discussion of guarantees by other states. The only possible solution seems to be direct action by the voters in the name of future taxpayers who could call for and pass a referendum prohibiting the issue of new tobacco settlement bonds and stopping the restructuring of existing bonds without voter approval. There's the solution, is for the voters themselves to take control of the issue now from the states. Do you think this is going to happen? Do you think the voters in these states are knowledgeable enough to even be able to understand this? I would suggest to you that the members of state legislatures feel, I think, with some reason, that they are totally safe and they don't have to worry about the voters in their own state because what the voters in their own states know is what these legislatures, legislators will tell them. And the fact of the matter is, do you think that the voters of any state are going to step forward and make good on a deal that's going to help out future generations? Or do you think the intent of the direction that, that governments seem to be going in is to saddle future generations with more and more debt in order to get reelected by current voters. Because, let's face it, if the legislatures owned up to this to the voters, none of them would be reelected. None of them. But I know here in West Virginia, the vast majority of voters don't know anything about this. All they hear in the election campaign ads that are on is vote against so-and-so because he's in bed with Obama. He supported Obama 94% of the time. He supported the Affordable Care Act. He joined Obama in his war on coal, and on and on and on. All this stuff was is untrue, and in the face of this is quite a diversion. Because this is the real issue. We would have a total turnover in the West Virginia State Legislature if voters knew about this. but they don't. And finally, and I realize we've gone past the top of the hour, but let me just read the final line here. And he says, Estes closes by saying, as for those non no smoking ads, tobacco-free kids reports that altogether the states will spend just 1.9% of their settlement payments and tobacco taxes on prevention programs this year. So don't hold your breath, is what Estes is saying. I think this is an absolutely incredible piece of, invest piece of investigative journalism. This is the kind of stuff that people need to know. to think that private firms, banks, and mutual funds 
are reaping this kind of profits as the result of a settlement in which people's health was was harmed, seriously harmed. And I guess one of the things that I would point out, which is just kind of a, a you know, and, 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 and add this on, West Virginia is considered to be the state probably with the worst record of smokers and young people smoking in the nation. West Virginia is one of these states. And not only have we diverted the money in other directions, but we have allowed it to not go where it was intended, namely into a much stronger, more focused campaign on curtailing cigarette smoking in West Virginia among the young. I was reading an article earlier today which suggested that so-called e-cigarettes, the electronic cigarettes, increasingly are being used by young people to smoke crack. So these kids are doing more than smoking. They're smoking with a purpose. If you know what I mean. Anyway, it's five minutes, actually it's six minutes after the hour, top of the hour. We're going to pause and take a, a five-minute break. Then we'll come back and we'll talk uh, and we'll get into a little bit about Thomas Jefferson's views on binding future generations. If there's ever an example of binding future generations in order to pay for the sins of the current one, I think we've seen it in this particular issue. You are listening to the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility. I'm Bill O'Brien, and after a short break, five minutes only, we will be right back and we'll complete our second hour together here at the Virtual Center. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome to our second hour here at the Virtual Center on this Monday, the 13th day of October, uh, officially Columbus Day, uh, as far as working people are concerned, since many of our folks are not working today uh, in order to enjoy the, the, long, the long weekend. I, I'm guessing that that's probably resulting in the fact that we've got some folks listening live today that aren't able uh, usually to do that because they're, they're on the job somewhere. And if that's true, and, and, this, and you are not a regular listener to the Virtual Center and are tuned in today, welcome. We, we appreciate you. Um, we invite you to participate actively by, by sharing your thoughts and your ideas with us here at the Virtual Center. We have a phone number that has been reserved just for that purpose. It is area code 304-574-8178. That's 304-574-8178. If you'd like to communicate your thoughts with me via email, I would love to have them. Uh, have your listen, uh, read your ideas, and and I promise that I will do the very best I can to respond to you. My email address is waobrian906 at gmail dot com. That's waobrian i e n nine o six at gmail dot com. <clears throat> If you are just joining us today, welcome uh, to our program here in the second hour. If you've been with us through the first hour, I thank you for staying with us. And I'm not going to uh, recreate the first hour again with the article on the tobacco settlement bonds. But the theme here, of course, is the decision by, by many states, especially these 12, to saddle future generations of taxpayers in these states with an absolutely monumental bill that has enabled banks and mutual fund operations 
to reap rewards in excess of 11,000 percent. On the decision of these states to settle for pennies on the dollar in order to get cash in hand right away rather than to live with the with the entire settlement decision reached in eight in 1998 which would have guaranteed states access to this money in perpetuity forever it is absolutely un unbelievable to me that this could happen one other thing occurred to me during our short break uh, that that it was ju it's just a, a, a you know a thought on top of what we've already what what I've already mentioned and what Estes already mentioned in this particular article and that is that these are the same state legislatures that the liberty amendments and those who seek a second constitutional convention in order to update or change the Constitution of the United States in order to return it to the Confederation status of the 1780s when the states were in the driver's seat, let's keep in mind that these legislatures that we're talking about here will be the recipients of that flow of power from the federal level to the state level if these conservative reformers are successful in their efforts with a second constitutional convention. That's even more frightening. Because what it suggests is that power is, return, is being returned to state legislatures whose behavior, at least on this issue, makes very clear to me that they don't warrant that particular power and they wouldn't know what to do with it if they got it. But the fact of the matter is they don't have to worry about it because those who are really behind this effort and are bankrolling the call for a second convention and bankrolling much of the political campaign ads prior to this coming fall election, they will be the ones who will be calling the shots. Not the legislatures. I think that's important to keep in mind as well. Again, our phone number, 304-574-8178. Thomas Jefferson. September 6th, 1789, in a letter to James Madison, says the following, I sit down to write to you without knowing by what occasion I shall send my letter. I do it because a subject comes into my head which I would wish to develop a little more than is practicable in the hurry of the moment of making up general dispatches. So Jefferson is writing a letter in order to expand on a thought that has come into his head. The question, whether one generation of men has a right to bind another, seems never to have been started either on this or on our side of the water. In other words, the right of one generation to bind future generations is a question, he says, that really hasn't come up for serious discussion, either in America or even in Europe. And, of course, he's in Europe. He's writing from Paris. Yet it is a question, he says, of such consequences as not only merit decision, but place also among the fundamental principles of every government. What Madison, uh, excuse me, what Jefferson, that's habit, <laughs> talking about J Madison so often. What Jefferson is saying to Madison here is that not only is this topic interesting, but actually this is a subject that really needs to get some attention because it 
sits among the most fundamental principles of every government. The course of reflection in which we are immersed here on the elementary principles of society has presented this question to my mind. And of course, 1789, Jefferson is in Paris at the beginning of what's going to be the French Revolution. So there's all sorts of change and all sorts of discussion going on around him about the very basic principles of society itself. And it's this discussion underway here in Paris that has brought this question to my mind. And that so, no such obligation can be transmitted, I think, very capable of proof. I set out on this ground, which I suppose to be self-evident, and this is the quote that I read at the outset of today's program. I set out on this ground, in other words, on this issue, which I suppose, he said, to be self-evident, quote, that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living. Usufruct is its uses to the public interest or for the general good. The earth belongs to the living for what it can do productively for future generations. And he goes on by saying that the dead have neither powers nor rights over it. Once you are dead, Jefferson is saying, you are dead. And your power goes into the grave with you. You ought not to continue to wield power over the living by what you have done or what you have obligated future generations to do. And, of course, I mentioned the article that we just looked at on the tobacco settlement money and what some states have chosen to do with that money. The portion occupied by an individual ceases to be his, the portion of the earth. The portion occupied by an individual ceases to be his when himself ceases to be. <laughs> That's a beautiful way of saying when you die, you die. But what portion of the earth you control when you are alive ceases when you cease and reverts to the society. If the society has formed no rules for the appropriation of its lands in severalty, it will be taken by the first occupants. These will generally be the wife and children of the decedent. In other words, if society hasn't made provision for the inheritance or the passing on of property, then when you die, it goes to your heirs, which is your wife and children, most likely. But then Jefferson says, if there are rules, if society has made these kinds of rules, if they have formed rules of appropriation, those rules may give it to the wife and children, or to some one of them, or to the legatee of the deceased. So they may give it to his creditor. In other words, it goes to the attorneys to pay off the debts of the person who died. But the child, the legatee, or the creditor takes it not by any natural right, but by a law of the society of which they are members and to which they are subject. Underline, bold, highlight that sentence. Jefferson is saying, when you inherit property, you do not do so because you have a natural right to it. You get it because of the rules of the society in which you live. You don't own it by any natural right, 
but by a law of the, of the society of which they are members and to which they are subject. So any argument about natural rights to property, Jefferson is saying, if you inherit it from somebody else, all the power that went with that property dies with the person who originally re got it or attained it. You don't have a natural right to it. Rather, it's the laws of the, of the society in which you live that entitle you to that particular property. Then no man can by natural right oblige the lands he occupied or the persons who succeed him in that occupation to the payment of debts contracted by him. Think about this. Then, Jefferson said, because you do not inherit property by natural right, but by the laws of society, therefore, no man can by natural right oblige the lands he occupied or the person who, persons who succeed him in that occupation to the payment of debts contracted by him. You do not have the right to obligate future generations to pay off the responsibilities of this one is what Jefferson is saying. We're going to have to think about this and we're going to have to reflect upon it because it's very important. Now Jefferson explains why that's true. Jefferson said, for if he could, if the owner of a property could obligate future generations to pay off his debts, if he could do that, Jefferson said, he might during his own life eat up the usufruct of the lands for several generations to come, and then the lands would belong to the dead and not to the living. Think about that. If you do have the right to, to tie future generations to pay off your debts, if that's true, then that gives you the flexibility to suck up all the future value of what you would leave and obligate those who come after you to take care of your responsibilities. You would be enjoying all the rights and bearing none of the responsibilities. Consequently, these properties would belong to the dead, not the living. Even though you died, you would still be in control, it, according to Jefferson's thinking. And this, Jefferson said, would be the reverse of our principle. What is true of every member of the society individual, individually is true of them all collectively, since the rights of the whole can be no more than the sum of the rights of individuals. Hey, Dr. Bill? Yes, Bob. May I jump in for just a moment, please? You certainly may. Uh, what you're talking about here, see, I don't know if you intended it, but it kind of fits rather seamlessly into the notion of Columbus Day. And I'm sitting here, well, been doing it all day long, kind of... Uh, Bob, I, ha I haven't thought of this. Go ahead. Kind of steaming at the idea that we still celebrate Columbus Day because in, in the second decade of the 21st century, we kind of know who Columbus was now. Yeah, we sure do. And we know what a monster he was. Yeah, he was. He, I, I read an article this weekend, and, he, and, and the author of the article said, we can tell our children that he was brave, uh, but all the other things we can't do. <laughs> here's, a, here's, a, here's a quote from his diaries, Dr. Bill. While I was in the boat, I captured a very beautiful Carib woman, whom the said Lord Admiral gave to me. Uh, actually, this isn't Columbus, this is one of his men. Right. Uh, when I had taken her to my cabin, she was naked, as was their custom. 
I was filled with a desire to take my pleasure with her and attempted to satisfy my desire. She was unwilling and so treated me with her nails that I wished I had never begun. But, to cut a long story short, I then took a piece of rope and whipped her soundly, and she let forth such incredible screams that you would not have believed your ears. Eventually, we came to such terms, I assure you, that you would have thought that she had been brought up in a school for whores. Oh. That oh. is what we celebrate today, Dr. Bill. Yep. Oh, yeah, Bob. Uh, it, it, and, and it goes, you know, I mean, there's, there's more and more of this stuff. Uh, Speaking what? of the natives, Columbus writes, They do not bear arms and do not know them, for I showed them a sword. They took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron. Their spears are made of cane. They would make fine servants. With fifty men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Right. And, and right. The, reason, the, reason I, the reason I mention all this, this is not a total tangential digression, but when Jefferson says that the usufruct of the land, the world, is to the living, He's not, I don't think he's saying that we should pay no, well, he's writing all of this, and, and, and the stuff he says about debt grabbed me too, and, and I'll just throw this in there. When he was talking about debtors taking possession of things by, uh, by unnatural practices, namely by, and what he means by that is artificial legal means, mm -hmm. that, they, that they aren't the natural laws or the laws of nature's God that had been referenced right. in the Declaration. right. Well, Jefferson is writing this with some bias, I would imagine, because he spent most of his life deep in debt, did he not? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. And he could see the natural end of everything to which he had set his hand. Uh, he could see what would happen to his estate in death. Mm -hmm. And he knew, he, knew, he knew that what was coming was coming. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, think, I, think he was, I think he was influenced by that. The idea, the idea that the that the that the money monsters would come and and render into nothing more than than dollars and cents the labor of a lifetime, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that is you know that's 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 offensive to someone who has worked all his life or her yes. life. Yes, it is to do. But at the same time, let's remember that uh, in the drafting. Uh, well, I mean, I, I've read it. I, I don't have. I don't know what the primary source is, but there's. It's often been said that the, the framers and the founders consulted, uh, for instance, the Iroquois, the, Iroquois, uh, the, yeah, the Haudenosaunee Confederation, Confederation yeah. yes. uh, for ideas of how to build a workable society. Uh, that is true, is it not? Yes, it is. Uh, well, let us, let, us continue, let us consider something uh, on this Columbus Day that those, that those people held to be an absolute immutable truth. And that is, uh, and I think they would agree, I think they would agree with Jefferson, or Jefferson might actually be agreeing with them, that life, and la that life is to the living. Right. That, uh, and, and, you know, there's an old English term called mortmain, which means dead hand. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it, it's a means by which the dead hand of the past could retain control of the present. Mm -hmm. uh, but to say that life is to the living looking in reverse to, toward the dead makes perfectly good se sense. But I don't think Jefferson would disagree, for instance, with Haudenosaunee notions that the living owe an obligation, and I think Jefferson touches on this with the idea of indebting future generations, the living owe a debt not to the past but to the future. To the future, yes. And so on this Columbus Day, it's worth noting that what the Europeans didn't take into account, the natives that they held to be so far beneath them already had. And that already what, had took it in, taken into account. And, yes. that, and, and that is to say, for instance, uh, no, no significant decision is entered into in native communities in this country and has not been entered into without the consideration of what the effect of that decision will have on seven future generations. Yes. What a yes. different country we would have. We, we would have. And, Bob, there's something else that you raise, and, and I, I don't know whether you intended I thought this is maybe where you were going, and I don't know whether this, this has occurred to you uh, uh, based on what you've said. But as you're talking, I'm thinking that there's also an issue here of binding future generations 
to an interpretation of the past that benefits you. Absolutely. And, 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 and so we're talking about that as a form of the power in the hands of the dead as well. And the, I thought, in fact, I thought that's what you were going to make, that was the point you were going to make about Columbus, that in a sense, we have chosen to reinterpret for, for generation after generation the story of Columbus in order to highlight the things we want to, to highlight and to repress those things about Columbus that we don't want future generations to know about or reflect upon at all. And that's a form of control as well. It, it, it absolutely is, and it is it, uh, to do so is to embrace the originalism of the Scalias of the world uh -huh. and to say that there can be no other interpretation going forward, no matter how much we learn nor how much we change. You know, right. on, on the other hand, uh, look at Madison. The, you know, the, I don't think a man of Madison's brilliance could help but look forward and wonder what they had wrought and what would come of it. And oh, I think yeah. Jefferson's doing it, you know, in the a Republic If You Can Keep It uh, uh, remark, Franklin exactly. is doing the same thing. Because I in saying, if you can keep it, he's wondering about the future. Right. I think, I, Bob, I think you're right on. And I think both of them are. And, I, and I, the reason I mentioned this, and I think the reason you want to mention it today on Columbus Day, and the reason I read that, uh, that, that uh, use that article from the New York Times is because we in our, every time we turn around, it seems to me we're we're compromising the future. We're we're putting the future, and I don't mean by the size of the deficit, because I know that's what some people are going to say. This is an argument against a huge deficit. No, it's not. It's an argument against the nation's willingness to pay off the deficit. And, and, and to promote the kinds of policies and the kinds of programs which will allow this generation to meet its obligations rather than pass them on to the future generations. And that's what the conservative Republicans in Congress are doing by tying up Congress in knots. They are making it impossible for this nation to fulfill its potential, which is absolutely necessary in order to meet the obligations of this particular generation. I think, I, I, I think you're absolutely correct, but I think we shortchange ourselves a little bit, Dr. Bill, if we think only in financial terms. Yes. Uh, I, and I, would, I, I, one, I am sorely aggrieved. At them. What business does West Virginia have celebrating Columbus Day? I know. Can you believe? Can, I, I, I know. I mean, okay, so there should be a, day, a paid day off for state workers in the fall. Let's make it on the autumnal equinox. How about? Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, you know that's good enough, and it doesn't have to have any religious significance. No. Um, but, it, and, and, but it has to be a Monday <laughs> or well, a Friday. Well, you know we can. Yeah. We can cheat. I mean, we, Columbus yeah, Day's tomorrow anyway. We cheat. Or yeah. was Sunday? Whatever. Was Sunday? Yeah. Uh, but you know, we the people who push hardest push back hardest against any. Um, well, I, mean, I don't know. You probably remember. Back when the data was for the, 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 the data was first reported that it had been definitively determined that uh, Norse people were in North America long before 1492, right? There were very, there were very nearly riots in Italian communities, right? Uh, and and so I guess we hang on to that as a sort of Italian heritage thing. But Lord, I mean, couldn't we change it to Da Vinci Day or? Yeah. Or, or Michelangelo Day, Day or, or exactly. You know, I mean, there's I, I, Bob. You really, you really onto something here, and I think you're right. And and the reasons that you are giving are legitimate ones. I really think they are. Well, I do, I do want to, I do, I do want to just press a little bit on this notion of, uh, of, of binding the future in terms other than money. And yes. and you know, you know where I'm going to go with my little soapbox any chance I get. Right, right. What what, um, what what better what, what are we doing? What are we doing to the earth? Is what you is uh, is I think where you will. It absolutely is. I mean, what? Yeah. How are? What kind of binding of the future are we doing when we have uh, when when we have multi billion gallon pits of 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 toxic waste that we're right. just leaving for future generations to deal That's with? That's right. To deal with. I agree. I agree. And and what's and, and the most interesting thing out of the seventh generations concept 
is that it is slowly moving into uh, what I call white culture consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, European consciousness. Yes. Uh, some people here in North America, um, and, and I don't mean to be racist in saying white, but I mean, you know. I know what you mean, yeah. Um, and it's in, it's in something that is referred to as the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle says that you ought not be able to do, you know, whether it be for commerce or, or whatever the motive is, you ought not be able to do something until you can prove that it will not harm people to do it. Mm -hmm. And not just in this generation, but going forward. Right. So, for instance, you know, the bill that we have in Congress, the ACE Act, the Appalachian Communities Health Emergency Act, H.R. 526, until this Congress ends, embodies the precautionary principle. Mm -hmm. Because it says that mountaintop removal should be studied and that a definitive finding should be made as to whether or not it can be safely done around human populations. And it further says that if the answer to that question is no, it cannot be, then it must end. Yes. Not just for the present, but right. for the future, uh, out of uh, a sense of precaution. Right. And what we're talking about here is the concern for future generations. And you're right. You know, you can't. Given what's happening with the environment, you can't you can't focus this literally on money too strongly. But on the other hand, the whole idea of turning the commons, the environment, into commodities with a price tag, and and and, and the most obscene part of that is that when after the price tag is met, the people who purchase it claim that they have a natural right to it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, and, oh the, my and the God, that's that's and the, that's the that's that is absolutely unconscionable. And but the Constitution enshrines it yes. in the notion that there cannot be a taking of property without due process of law. Without due process of law, that's right. Uh, but you're you're ab you're absolutely right because I mean, look at um, remembering, of course, that thanks to Citizens United, corporations are people too now. Oh yeah. Well. Do you, do, are any of us silly enough to think that a fracking company or an oil company or a coal company is going to stick around in a region after all the resources after are gone? After all the resources are gone. Of course not. So, course not. Who's, so, so to whom falls the responsibility when one of those sludge dams bursts and, and billions of gallons of poison roar down, a, roar down a, mount, uh, a mountain river valley and kill everything and everyone in sight? Act of God. Act of God. Well, we know that that's what Arch Moore that's pled right. back in 1972. Right. You know, Shelley Moore Capito's daddy. That's right. That's right. Bob, you ra you've raised issue the it's issues here that are that are incredibly important. I I really think that Jefferson's right. This is this is a this is an issue that every government needs to reflect upon. And he was also right in saying that up until that point, nobody had. And of course, the fact of the matter is, it doesn't end up in our constitution either. Or they, or they, or they had in the negative. I, I suppose we might say, Doctor Bill, because you know, certainly, if you if you go to law school, you'll study. I mean, the the English tried to deal with it. The one of one of the things that devils law students is an is is a piece of arcana called the rule against perpetuities. And the rule against perpetuities. Let's see if I can even recite it. Um, a bequest must vest, if it vests at all, within, what is it, 20 years of a life in being? Okay. So that means that you can't, you can't just tie up property by saying, I'm going to give it to so-and-so and so-and-so's -so children and so-and-so's children and so-and-so's children. Because there has to be a life in being somewhere along the way. Right. By well, which, Jeff, Jefferson will will address this in this letter. I had well, I, I had I had a feeling, but the you know the the question I think that we could ask is if you're truly as as he talks about wanting to to do if you truly want to set up uh, an egalitarian society, why not do away with ideas of inheritance altogether? Mm -hmm. Why not do away or 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 if nothing else? Why not do? Why not put significant caps on inheritance, which is what this country once did with the estate tax? Yes. You know, you can get along. There's certain. You know, we can settle. We can set an amount of money there and say, listen, if you can't get along on this, you can't get along. That's right. 
That's right. But, you know, there's no reason, and this is the person who always gets brought up, there is no reason that Paris Hilton should become a billionaires because she's a member of the Lucky Sperm Club. Yeah. 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 Oh, Bob. You, you, are, so, you are so right here. I mean, and this is, this is so, you know, it's so important. Tying it to Columbus Day is not something that I had, that I had in mind at all, so I'm really glad you did this. Well, because I, I, I think I think you've made a connection that really was begging to be made, and I was I was not going to make it. Well, so funny, sure, funny, funny little things happen inside my brain when I'm, I'm sitting sure here listening to you. I'm sure glad you made it. No, I, I think I think it's wonderful. It adds so much to this. But um, wow, I, I and and you know, and I'm I'm so concerned. You know, I am so concerned because I knew when I was reading this, that, that some people who would read this would jump to the conclusion and say, this is an argument against government spending beyond income. No, it isn't. It's not at all. It's not at all. It's basically an argument in favor of assuming the responsibilities that go with the rights that you claim. Absolutely. And, and yeah. as, as Jefferson looks at, at his own life's work, and recognizes the debt he lives perpetually in. What do you think he would prefer, Doctor Bill? Having having creditors come scrambling all over his the, the the works of his roads and days, or having it as cheat to the state and letting it do some good for the entire polity? Right, right. exactly. Because it's and, because there's no third there's no there's no third possibility. No. And that that's one of the arguments that that Andrew Carnegie makes about the responsibilities of the wealthy, the gospel of wealth, is that, you know, that, that, I mean, Carnegie is perfectly in favor of the state taking over and doing the things with your wealth that you refuse to do while you're alive. Yeah. I mean, and that... Build some that, roads, know, roads, some bridges. Yeah, exactly. Feed some hungry people. And we don't do it. I mean, we, uh, not, we don't, not only don't we do it, but we have this whole body of ideological crap that people use to argue against the right of the of society to do this it's right. unbelievable and it's a it's a violation it's not consistent with the thinking of the founders and i think this proves it it's an indication that the founders were way the hell ahead of where we are oh yeah but on the other hand i don't think it's something that we didn't think about i think that i think you're right it's something that we consciously choose to not talk about Exactly. Well, Dr. Bill, right. I thank you. I thank you for thank the little you, interlude. Oh, I want to make sure you. that I don't impede your thank ability to get to the rest no, of the matter. No, you're not. Listen, thank you very much, Bob. What well, you've what you've done has add so much. Thank you. My pleasure, Dr. Bill. Okay, thank buddy. you. Um, you know that I it's it's hard to add to that, but I do want to at least uh, we we have about about fifty fourteen minutes or twelve minutes or so left in our in our time together today, and we can finish this tomorrow. But um, Bob was talking about. Uh, the legal principle of establishing a time limit on how long you can for how long you can bind property Jefferson explain, explains this brilliantly and I wanted to share this because I think it, it is so beneficial if everybody could be exposed to this way of thinking it would be it would be un, unbelievable Jefferson said no man can by natural right oblige the lands he occupied or the persons who succeed him in that occupation to the payment of debts contracted by him. For if he could do that, he might during his own life eat up the usufruct, the value of the lands, for several generations to come, and then the lands would belong to the dead, not to the living. And, and of course, if you think about that, it makes perfect sense. He's, he's exactly right, which would be the reverse of our principle, Jefferson says. Then he gets into the issue of groups, and he, comes, he gets into this analysis, analysis or explanation, which I think is brilliant. He said, what's true of every member of society individually is true of them all collectively as well, since the rights of the whole can be no more than the sum of the rights of the individuals in it. To keep our ideas clear, Jefferson says, when applying them to a multitude, now he gives us a what if, or let's suppose. 
He said, let us suppose a whole generation of men to be born on the same day. Imagine a whole generation of people all born on the same day to attain mature age on the same day and to die on the same day leaving a succeeding generation in the moment of attaining their mature age altogether. Let's assume that instead of each individual being born on a certain day, maturing at a certain day, and dying at a certain day, let's assume that we had a whole generation for whom that all happens at the same time. Let the ripe age be supposed of 21 years. Let's, let's assume that the age of maturity, the ripe age, be supposed at 21, and their period of life 34 years more than 21, that being the average term given by the bills of mortality to persons who have already attained 21 years of age. In other words, what Jefferson is saying in 1789 is that the mortality tables, that, as such as they were, that existed at that time said that if you live to be 21, you would likely live no more than 34 more years beyond that, which would be 55. 34 plus the 21. Each successive generation, Jefferson said, would in this way come on and go off stage at a fixed moment, as individuals do now. Then I say the earth belongs to each of these generations during its course, fully and in their own right. The second generation receives it clear of the debts and encumbrances of the first, the third generation of the second, and so on. For if the first could charge it with a debt, then the earth would belong to the dead and not the living generation. <coughs> Jefferson goes on. Then no generation can contract debts greater than may be paid during the course of its own existence. At 21 years of age, they may bind themselves and their lands for 34 years to come, because that's all they can be expected to live. So whatever obligations you make, there's a 34-year time limit on the responsibility to meet those obligations. At 22, for 33 years. At 23, 32 years. And at 54, for one year only. Because these are the terms of life which remain to them at those respective epochs. But a material difference must be noted between the succession of an individual and that of a whole generation. Individuals are parts only of a society subject to the laws of a whole. These laws may, be appropri may, may appropriate the portion of land occupied by a descendant, by a decedent, to his creditor rather than to any other or to his child on condition he satisfies the creditor. But when a whole generation, that is the whole society, dies, as in the case we have supposed, and another generation or society succeeds, this forms a whole. And there is no superior who can give their territory to a third society who may have lent money to their predecessors beyond their faculty of paying. So in other words, you cannot obligate a future gen you cannot obligate your own generation with responsibilities beyond its lifetime, beyond the responsibilities that it can satisfy them. If you do, if you bind not only this next generation, but the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one, if you, as Bob pointed out in his call, if you suck the value out of the land itself, out of the environment that future generations must depend on in order to live, and if you leave them problems which are going to sink them in debt 
in order to try to undo what you have done, you have violated your obligations to future generations. You have violated your obligations to the society, to the nation, to its people. You are not a hero. You are not an entrepreneurial hero, a self-made man, as it were. You are a villain. You are a criminal. And the fact of the matter is, this is the kind of analysis that will lead to the real realization as to exactly how much of a criminal, how much of a villain you really are. Consequently, those who do this are meticulous in rewriting the rules of society in order to make what they are doing not a crime, but irony of ironies, a service to future generations because you are, the, you are providing future generations with a model of behavior that they should mimic in order to be as successful as you were successful. In effect, what you are doing to future generations is no different than if you walked into a bank and pulled a gun and, 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 re and re forced, required, the person behind the counter to give you all the resources and all the assets of all the people who have put their money in that bank because they believed that it was safe there. This is the kind of analysis that we must teach our young people how to perform. We have got to allow our young people access to the sources so that they can begin to understand and to develop the basis for making sound, justifiable evaluations and decisions on the directions that society ought to go in, on the laws that it passes, and on the quality of the people elected to represent them. It goes all the way back to the 18th century belief that in a republic, you do not elect people to represent you who have a vested interest in turning the laws of society to their own advantage. You have got to find ways to elect people who will put the public interest, the good of the whole, ahead of their own self-interest. And that's what the founders, the framers in the Constitution tried to do. That's what Madison tried to do by distilling the public voice through groups of citizens. The assumption is, Madison's assumption is, that if you do enough distillations of the public voice, you will each time filter out a little bit more of self-interest and you have a much better chance of reaching a state where elected representatives will indeed be willing to put the public interest as their priority. It is 58 minutes after the hour. I think the best thing we can do is stop here and with a promise that we will pick up on Jefferson's argument again in tomorrow's program. Please remember that tomorrow's program will begin one half hour later than today, in the East at 1.30 p.m. Please remember also that we will not be doing a live program at the Virtual Center on Wednesday this week. Tomorrow will be the final program that we will, that we will be doing this week. For the Virtual Center for the Study of the U.S. Constitution and Civic Responsibility, I think what we've done today in the nature of civic responsibility 
is yeoman duty. I really believe that. In behalf of the Virtual Center and on behalf of myself personally, thank you so very, very much. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy. Be safe. And thank you.